Amy Thomas, how are you? Oh, hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. You know what? I, I don't see what, is it a pain in the, in the butt to bring? Not um, at all. I'm just going to throw it in my bag. That way, okay. yeah, just let your director or your one of your producers, you know, anyone in audio, just let them know yeah. I'm going to bring my own 416. I think they'll be happy. 416. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will let them know that they're over here now. Hi, this is Randy Thomas, and you're listening to my take. That's not what she wanted me to say, though. <laughs> so this is an outtake. <laughs> Magic. Hey, good girl. <laughs> Uh, shit. Now sit, you big giant baby. Okay. Hi, this is Randy Thomas, and you're watching My Take with Paula Tiso. Hey, guys, I'm here at Randy Thomas's studio. Can you hear me? I'm going to play this back. So the booth is obviously under construction because Dee was amazing to give me this booth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it cost me a couple of grand to get it, have it put back together sure. and assemble it. Well, uh, the first job that really propelled me, I think, into a space where um, I was heard all the time. I was a disc jockey, and that was hooked on phonics. To be a part of a reading program, the first time I did their commercial, you know, if your child has a reading problem, any kind of reading problem, get hooked on phonics. Call 1-800-ABCDEFG. And I was just a DJ at the time, and I couldn't believe that radio stations and TV across the country were playing that spot once every 30 seconds somewhere in America between the late 80s and the early 90s. It was crazy. A lot of children learned to read with Hooked on Phonics. So that was the first thing that I did where people actually knew who I was. Um, mostly people in radio that had to cart those spots up in the middle of the night going, I hate this girl. Why do I have to hear this spot all the time? But from there, um, when I was on the air here in L.A., I became the first woman to do the Oscars, 1993. It was uh, the year of the woman. So someone had the brilliant idea, let's put a woman behind the microphone for year of the woman. And um, I was very blessed that they chose me and it literally changed everything in my life. So then I went on to be the first woman to do the Emmys, the SAG Awards, Miss America, um, Kennedy Center Honors, which I'm returning uh, this year for my fifth consecutive year, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, things like that, um, to today uh, being the voice of Nightline. Tonight, it's a very special Nightline. Entertainment Tonight, um, I was their voice for like 10 years, a little more than that. Now Nightline and doing some specials for ABC News. So yeah, that's that's some of the stuff that I'm doing and I love it. I feel so blessed to use my voice that way. Magic smile for the camera. So let's talk about music connection and what inspired you to start this project and a little <laughs> bit about it. <laughs> the Music Connection podcast was born out of my husband who used to be in the music business when I was a DJ on the radio. Um, <clears throat> he also worked with a magazine called Music Connection. So that was like 35 years ago, and Music Connection's been around for almost 40 years. And Arnie spoke with Eric uh, Batelli, who's the publisher, and he said, do you want to move this out into the future? Because as we all know, magazines have a expiration date on them. The magazine industry isn't what it used to be. So basically, by working with us and helping create the podcast, we've been able to get incredible artists and interview them. So my husband is my co-host, but if you can imagine, I was a DJ for over 20 years, now a 25-year voiceover career, and I'm tough to sit next to if you're doing a podcast with me. So for us, it's there's a lot, we're like the Bickersons. So I think if you tune into our podcast, occasionally you'll hear me be shocked at the question he just asked or... Whatever. So it, it kind of is about our relationship and um, how annoying we can get with each other. But there's also a lot of love and respect for the music and the artists. And we've expanded our team. We have a gal named Anita Gevinson out of Philadelphia. My daughter, Rachel Wall, who's a senior at USC, is doing interviews for us. Um, we have an upcoming one with Jesse McCartney. With you and your kids, you must remember, like, he was part of their childhood. So she's all excited because... 
he has a new record out. She's like, I want to do that interview. And uh, so that's coming up soon. Um, and uh, Carson Beck, who's a phenomenal voice actor, he is our announcer. And we just have a good time. And we're 60 something episodes in. So um, we've learned a few things. And we've spoken with incredible artists from Ty Dolla Sign to Daryl Hall, Don Was, who's a producer artist. He's also president of Blue Note Records. And right now he's on the road with Bob Weir playing with the Wolf Brothers. He's incredible. Um, to ex-ambassadors, Greta Van Fleet, all of these great artists and so many young up and coming artists that we just have a blast. It's really, really fun. And it's not radio because we actually drop in songs and we talk to them about and they can use any kind of language they want. So it's very different from radio and we're loving it. That looks good. Let me turn it down just a touch. Check one, two, one, two. So, Randy, from your start in radio that you mentioned a little bit, and uh, to Hooked on Phonics, which I remember so distinctly, <laughs> live announcing for the Academy Awards, first woman to do that, and, and many other uh, live announced jobs, first woman, you are a groundbreaker and the voice for entertainment tonight as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're a groundbreaker and you've paved the way for so many other women voiceovers. It's incredible. Mm. Um, I want to know, like, with such a long career, what, what continues to fire you up? Um, and what do you love about this wild and crazy career? <sighs> wow. Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say what still fires me up is the fact that um, I don't like to, uh, so I, I'm very blessed. I've had the opportunity to make all of these firsts for women and I've done them and they're part of my bio, but I don't live in that world. For me, that's yesterday, that was. For me, what excites me, what, what keeps me passionate about what I do is what I'm doing today and what I'm expecting to do tomorrow. So I, I'm not someone who would ever sit on their laurels. I am more interested in continuing to break ground. As, as you know, I just did the election night for ABC, and they told me that I was the first woman in history for them to ever go to a woman on election night to be that big network news voice. So to know that I just broke another glass ceiling, so to speak, with ABC. Uh, also being the voice of Nightline, they've been around almost 40 years choosing uh, me as the first woman. That excites me. That, And it sort of saddens me in a way that we're still in that place as women with our voices in this industry, that we're just finally being heard in certain environments and, and times, time slots and networks, um, that astounds me, but I feel really blessed. And if that's going to be my brand, that I'm the first woman who let me continue to knock those doors down. But I'm still as passionate today as I was 25 years ago when I first started. So I do want to talk about me and Roberta Solomon. We just made history also. Apparently it's going to be Roberta and myself imaging KCBS in the Bay Area. The program director chose me and Roberta as the imaging voices. And I'm like, what major market station decides they're going to have two women brand their news talk? Like, that was astounding to me. But that's a first. You know, m most radio imaging, they have a male voice, they have a female voice. I I've never heard them take two women and say, this is who will be branding our station. So I applaud uh, uh, Jennifer Seelig, the program director. Amazing. That is amazing. Congratulations. Describe to us the process um, of how you stay in the moment. <laughs> ding, ding. That's a good way. <laughs> okay. Describe the process of how you stay in the moment while live announcing. Hmm. Well, for someone who is as ADD as I am, it's a challenge. I definitely, I, I tend to wander. It's very difficult for me to stay focused for even an hour, let alone three or four hours plus an entire day of rehearsal. Um, I think fear is what drives me to stay motivated. And also my method is a lot of times when you get your script, when you're doing a big live show, um, sometimes the script department will do it for you if they know the way you like 
like to have your book assembled. Uh, other voice actors like to mark their own pages. So I have a couple of colors that I use. Um, red would be live announce. Uh, blue would be if they're calling for an SOT from me or some sort of an announce that's on tape. Um, I still flag them so that I'm on page just in case something happened when they go roll X and X isn't there, at least I'm right there and they can just, you know, pop the mic on and, and, and save it. So I, that is pretty much my, my drill is that I, I look through the book. I know where all of my announces are and whatever, and winner walk-ups. Once someone wins, then that becomes its own color because that's a winner walk-up. And I just go page by page. If someone's singing a song and I have all of the lyrics for the song, I will be reading the lyrics along. All right, let's face it. I'm singing the lyrics along. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my mic is off. And I'm going through page by page so that I'm always in the moment. And they're always telling you, um, okay, uh, stand by announce, stand by this, you know, stand by to send them out. And so when you're in standby, you get two cues. One is stand by announce and the other is cue announce. So you always want to make sure you know which one is which. And, um, and that's how you do it. You just, it's, it's a dance, you know, when you're a part of a show like Oscars, I, I just completed 20 years of Tony awards. Um, and it was my ninth Oscars in 2018. You just feel like, um, okay, I've done it before, but everything is new all the time. As we learned two years ago at the Oscars, that anything can happen. And uh, I was there, you know, I, I read my, my winter walk up for La La Land when they asked for it. They were, you know, and the winner, La La, and I'm, this is La La Land's blah, blah, you know, and I'm reading it all. And it was only after that moment that we realized something's wrong, what's happening. And then of course it went to Moonlight and I quickly went to my moonlight walk up just in case they were going to call for it. But uh, obviously, all of the action was on the stage on everything that was happening and the uh, moonlight uh, people being able to come up and accept their award. It was crazy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about adrenaline, huh? It is. It's a big time adrenaline job. It's it's very nerve wracking. Um, you definitely want to be careful what you eat <laughs> beforehand, just in case, you know, because when your stomach gets excited, when you're nervous, when you're excited, you don't want to eat anything that's going to bother you or... Um, What's like a typical diet for the day of a show? Mm. What, what do you eat? Well, leading up to the show, it really starts, I back it up about 30 days or so before, and I do try to eat healthfully most of the time. I, you know everything organic and fruits and vegetables and um, some protein and I try to not eat too much meat or have more fish or chicken, whatever, um, or more plant-based food as my daughter is urging me to. But when it comes to doing uh, a major show, which I'm really in training now because I have SAG Awards, I have um, uh, the Academy's Governor Awards, and then I'm going to go to Washington for Kennedy Center. So I pretty much try to eschew all the sugar <laughs> because if you have too much sugar and you're put in a very stressful situation, which as we know Live Announce is, um, your immune system, if you take an emotional hit, your immune system will drop and something can come in and get you. So I, I avoid sugar, um, you know, with those trucks around and all the garbage candy and stuff. I try to stay away from that. And I really just want fruits and vegetables on day of show. Cool. That's it. Lean protein, maybe a little piece of chicken, but without all the sauce on it. So, hey, let's quickly talk about someone starting out in live announcing. Mm -hmm. Where can they find opportunities for, you know, a beginning live announce? Yeah. The interesting thing about live announce is today, much of it is not really live. So you are just the announcer that's being played out in a live situation. A lot of what I do, um, I do track and then they play me back in the theater. When I do the Directors Guild Awards, <clears throat> I track everything and they play it back, but I'm invited there and in case something changes, then I'm there to help them. But yeah, so a lot of times you're just being played back live. I suggest to anyone that wants to do live announce to 
um, record a live program, write down the announcer's words, and uh, just practice on your own how that would feel. But then figure out, depending on your age, if you have children and your children are in school, I say go volunteer at school. They have fundraisers, they have different kinds of events and evenings and um I say volunteer for that. Uh, if you live in a city where you have a huge, um, uh, you know, like a Staples Center or an LA Live where conferences and things are coming through, reach out, find out who is booking those. Make sure that there's a demo of you available because sometimes a show will come in or uh, like an awards dinner or some sort of an event will come into a place and they kind of have an idea of what kind of an announcer they want, but they feel like they have to bring them in from somewhere else. If you said, hey, I live in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I want to be the event voice for you, then they know, oh, here's someone who's doing some live. They live right here and we can hire that person and we don't have to fly them in or do something like that. So locally, there are places and ways that you can get involved with your community, with fundraisers, find out who's doing some of the bigger fundraisers, offer your voice for it. Um, those are great ways to be a part of uh, live events. You get that same sense of anticipation of uh, introducing people and, and knowing everything has a schedule and you've got to help them stay on schedule. Because I really think the job of the announcer at the end of the day is to move the show forward quickly in a timely yet elegant, classy manner and everyone that you're introducing, you are in love with them. You think they are the greatest. And if you truly can wrap yourself around that, no matter who you're introducing, if it's the chief of the fire department or you know um, the guy that's gonna help you with tax tips, be in love with them and make them feel really welcome. And that's all good practice. And then there are some of the marketing sites that do offer live opportunities that you have to audition for. And these are mostly, you're talking about people that don't have agents. Those who do, if you create uh, a live demo, you submit it to your agents, and then they go, oh, she's totally ready to do live. Let's include her in the next auditions that we get. My question is, what are the guiding principles in your career? And you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's a little different than, you know, what fires you up, but it's kind of like, you know, your sense of who you are in, in the picture of your career. So what are the guiding principles in your varied and illustrious career? Wow, that's a deep and heavy question there, Paula T. So let me think about that. <laughs> I would hope that they don't stray too much from my guiding principles in life, and that is to live a life with an open heart, um, always willing to give back, always willing to do a little more, you know, I think for those of us that are in voiceover that came out of radio, I think we're particularly grateful for this life that we have doing announcing uh, voiceover at all levels. I think that we're just really grateful that we get to do this. Um, so uh, I would say be honest, be kind. Um, when you are dealing with clients, don't bug them too much. <laughs> I'm kind of a nudge, I think. And I think I've sort of set that up as people know me as someone who is a little bit aggressive about what I want, you know, because for a long time I was fighting against the guys to get what I wanted. I really wasn't fighting against other women. I was trying to just get out there in front of the guys. And I don't know that that's actually changed today. I have a, a big vision for where I want to be in the next few years in order to really achieve what I want to do. And um, I think that's why you have to have a kind heart and, um, you know, just a, a good nature. You can't be too deterred by um, rejection and failure. You have to just chalk it up to wasn't meant for me. Someone needed it more. And I, I like to use those principles. They don't always work, but I try. <laughs> well, let's talk about, um, you, you just kind of touched upon uh, rejection. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that. I liked what you just said. I mean, that's just really it in a nutshell. I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, 
you know, about a voiceover career and rejection? Yeah. Well, I think if you want rejection, get into voiceover because it's a daily part of our lives. If it devastates you, if you have um, maybe emotional challenges and are battling certain things, voiceover may not be for you. If you truly cannot take being rejected, which every day, if you're a true voiceover artist, you are auditioning and you are being passed on every single day. If you let that devastate you, then you should really find another way to make a living. If you can have a more spiritual um, uh, feeling about it, that it's not meant for me, someone needed it more, um, or then I just resort to, you know what? everything that has come to me has come to me at the right time. And all of the rejections, all of the challenges, I think it's just the universe's way of testing your commitment. Because if you're ready to throw it in and let, oh, well, that's it, I can't take one more rejection, then you really should get out. I think the business is for those of us who say, yeah, I get rejected all the time. But that just means I'm that much closer to my next win, you know? And that's how I like to look at it. I've never had anything come easily to me, and I've spent a lot of time in my life working on myself, understanding, you know, I think what we've given our children, what you give your children, what I've given my daughter, is that they are loved, so loved, and that you can do no wrong. You know, just come to me, tell me. I never had that. I really didn't have the support. I never really knew how loved I was because I had a lot of, um, uh, rejection, even in my own personal life. Um, and uh, yeah, so those sort of challenges have definitely created imbalance within me in terms of trying to deal with life now that I'm a grown up and I'm supposed to handle everything so well. Well, some days I do and some days I don't. You know, it just depends on the day, what it is, and how it hits me. But no matter how I react in a moment, I'm definitely uh, someone who looks at my life. How can I make it better? How can I fix what I just screwed up? You know, what's the lesson on what made me do that? Um, you know, we're, we're all works, uh, works in progress. And I love that. I love that I put myself out there every day. I screw up big time and I accomplish things big time. And finally, beneath the beauty. For 15 years, she was the highest paid supermodel in the world. Giselle Bunchen sharing her deeply private struggles. 